This this is the game against Aviv Friedman from the Marshall Chess Club in 1993. I was about 16 years old when I played this one, and he's a pretty strong master. It was the opening, again, that I've worked on with Maurice Ashley, the exchange French, and the position was the same, 11 or 12 moves deep. So let's move to there. On Black's 11th move, he played bishop f5. In the last game, you recall, Todd Luna played bishop g4. I played f3, and then he played bishop to f5. I played knight g3, and then he played bishop back to d7. In this game, Aviv played bishop to f5, I played knight g3, and instead of bishop to d7, he played bishop to g6. And I began the plan which I mentioned before, f4. A very strong idea, which is the basis of the opening. Now my next move will be f5, trapping his bishop. Then the bishop can't come to h5 because my knight and queen control the square. He has to figure out a way to save the piece. If he plays queen d7, he in fact does not defend the f5 square because I play f5, and if the bishop takes, knight takes, queen takes, he's lost control of the e7 bishop, and I win it. Rook takes e7. He'll lose a piece if he defends that way. If he tries to stop f5 by playing bishop to d6... Point being, f5, bishop takes g3. The move I play is very simple. I play rook e1 back to f1. My plan is still f4 to f5. And now there's no way to stop it. He has to play h6. And after f5, bishop h7. The position is similar, except now when I bring a knight to e4, I'll attack the bishop on d6. I'll have a gain tempo. And the rook on f1 helps to hold up my f5 pawn. So in fact, how he played was correct. After f4, he played h6, made a little room for his bishop. I played f5, drove it back, and he played bishop h7. So immediately we can feel that a large part of this battle will be my maintaining my f5 pawn, which locks in his bishop on h7, and him trying to exploit the weakness of the f5 pawn and trying to also do something about the d4 pawn, which can be a problem. If you look at it, my, only my queen defends the d4 pawn. And if he could line up somehow an, atta an attack on the pawn with a bishop, and a queen or rooks, then I could get into some difficulty. Also, a possibility for black at one point would be to play C C6 to C5. If black makes the board explode right away, opening up the center, and trades down, and tries to make the F5 pawn weak, then he could be all right. My job is to maintain my pawn structure and keep his bishop hemmed in on H7. So here my first move is bishop to E3. The root move I really want to make is queen D1 to F3, because it's a great square for the queen. It can't be attacked by anything, and I'm holding the F5 pawn. But I can't play that because my d4 pawn hangs. Queen takes d4 check. So I play bishop e3 to defend my d4 pawn with the idea of queen f3. He plays knight bd5. I didn't want to trade bishop for knight. And this brings up another very important theme around the discussion of trading. When to trade and when not to trade. Because this is something which a lot of players don't really know. When should I trade down and when shouldn't I? If you have a positional advantage, an advantage in space, and you're trying to crunch your opponent, you don't want to trade down. And if you think about it, that makes perfect sense. If your opponent has space and you're cramped, you want to trade down pieces so you have, you have less pieces to move in your cramped structure. If you have space, you want to keep on pressuring and pushing him back further and further without ha allowing him to trade and come out. So he played knight bd5, and I played bishop to f2, moving away, also maintaining a defense of the d4 pawn a little later. He attacked my pawn on f5. I brought my queen to f3, where it wanted to go anyway. And now we feel what's happening in this game. I am defending my pawns on f5 and d4, and he is trying to come out. He's trying to break through. The f5 pawn is my key weakness, but also my key strength. And so we feel that, once again, the whole game becomes in one way or another about the bishop on h7, because that's hemmed in by my pawn on f5. And so his whole focus is on that one pawn. He played the move bishop e7 to d6. Now his threat here is bishop takes g3, bishop takes g3, queen takes f5, removing the defender of the f5 pawn. So I defended my pawn once again, bishop c2. And he played knight d5 to e7. And this is the key moment. It looks as if, in a way, my position has sort of come to a standstill. He is attacking the f5 pawn three times, and I'm defending it three times. But unfortunately for me, that's not the whole story. He's also attacking my defender, my knight on g3. So in fact, my f5 pawn is in trouble. His threat is bishop takes g3, bishop takes g3, and then knight takes f5. Bishop takes f5, queen takes f5, 
queen takes f5, bishop takes f5, and at the end of that variation I'm down a pawn, and I've lost my f5 pawn. His bishop on, sh on h7 has suddenly become very active, and things are looking very bleak. But I had a plan a number of moves ago, that in this position I would play a very interesting exchange sacrifice, rook e1 to e5. I really like this move. And the idea is twofold, or more than twofold maybe. For one thing, I'm very simply defending my pawn on f5. My rook on e5 is defending the pawn on f5. But beyond that, what I'm, it, it, it's a move which is it, it's walking into the fire. My rook is sticking itself directly in front of the bishop on d6. I'm simply ex sacrificing the exchange. But if he takes my rook on e5, I'm going to gain an initiative. And this brings up an important question of the quality of pieces. The rook is worth 5 and the bishop is worth 3. That's well known. But in different positions, the value of those pieces change. His bishop on d6 is a very strong piece. For one thing, it's threatening the very foundation of my position, which is indirectly my f5 pawn. And another thing, it can eventually attack my d4 pawn. My rook on e1 is also a good piece. But I feel if I improve my structure by my pawn eventually coming to e5, and I trade off for the bishop on d6, I'm going to get a very large attack. This brings in the discussion of time. I'm giving up material for quality and time. Garry Kasparov describes chess within three dimensions, time, material, and quality. And it's a very interesting way of discussing the chess game. After bishop takes e5, d takes e5, what I'll be doing is I've given up material, but I've improved my quality because my pawn has come into the attack, and I've gained time because I'm attacking this knight, and now I have a very strong initiative. He didn't want to do this right away. He waited a moment. He played rook f to e8. And I played rook a to e1. Two improving moves. Strange moves to play. It's just a crazy position. He wanted to control the e-file. I actually prefer for black to maintain the rook on f8 guarding the f7 square. I think it would have been a little more accurate from to play rook a to e8 to maintain the defensive position of his rook on f8. During the game, I felt that was his best move. I would still have played rook a to e1. I still like my position, but I think it was a slight improvement for black. Slightly better defense. So he took on e5, bishop takes e5, I played d takes e5, and he played knight f to d5. And here we have to deal with the realities of compensation in chess. Compensation is simply when you're down material, and you have something for the material, whether it's time or quality. And in this position, the compensation that I have is a little bit of both. I have an attack, potentially, and I really like my pieces. He has nothing to oppose my bishop on f2. This piece will be very good later on. Also, his rook on a8, which is the advantage of the exchange that he has, isn't doing all that much right about now. But he's playing knight fd5, has a, a, has a threat, really. He wants to simply play knight takes c3, because I have a spatial advantage. If you look at my pawns on e5 and f5, they're taking space. They're cramping his game. His bishop on h7 is hemmed in. His queen on d7 is knight on e7. Nothing can really move that much. If he can, say, trade off a pair of knights and then put the other knight on d5, then suddenly he has less pieces. He has less to work with within his cramped space. I want to leave his cramp. I want to keep his pieces tangled up. And this brings up another very important relationship to, to look at. When knights are connected, it can be very good, because they, they, they can support themselves, but, can, but it can also be very bad. If I leave these two knights here, their mobility is impeded by one another. If I play the move knight c to e4, which is what I did, you notice that knight on e7 has only one really good square, which is d5, but there's already knight on d5. And if the knight on d5 goes somewhere to make room for the other knight, then he'll be unhappy. So the knights are stepping on each other's toes. This is also very important, because if you can attack one of the knights, then the other knight will be left exposed. So often in chess, when your opponent has connected knights, they're in fact simply duplicating the other one's efforts. And you should move away and leave them both, to kind of run into one another for a little while. It can be a very useful tool. And of course, there's also knight c to e4. This is also a move related to the rules of trading. You don't want to trade down material when you're behind. I have a spatial advantage now. I have an initiative. He's cramped, and I'm down material. All of that says, don't trade down. And I didn't. I played knight c to e4. Now, a tactical moment has to be heated here. Can he play knight takes f5? It looks as if maybe the f5 square isn't defended enough. If knight takes f5, I play knight takes f5. He plays bishop takes f5. Now what do I do? I have a number of options here. Some are good, 
Some are better. One is winning. One thing I can play is knight f6 check. But this move isn't correct, because he plays g takes f6, and after I take on f5, he can figure out ways to defend. My best move is something less forcing, but in fact more forcing. It's not check, but it works very well. I play knight e4 to c5. I'm attacking his queen, and suddenly I've opened up the, the attack of my bishop on his bishop on f5. He can't defend both his queen and his bishop. If he plays queen e7, my bishop on f2 defends my knight on c5. I just play queen takes f5. And now I have two pieces for a rook, which we know is an advantage. I'm threatening queen h7 checkmate. Queen h7, king f8, queen h8 checkmate. And he's in big trouble. So in fact, my pawn on f5 is defended indirectly by that tactic. Of course, knight c4 would not be possible without the idea of a, dis without the idea of a discovered attack on the f5 piece eventually. After I played knight c4, he played knight to b4. Because his pieces were so tangled up, and his knight on e7 was an uncomfortable piece, and I was threatening maybe to play f6 to attack the knight on e7 and to bust open his king side. He had to un untangle a bit. He played knight to b4. And now I played a move which was of a, of a similar feel a little bit to my last move. The idea of avoiding trades and playing slowly, even when down material. I sacrificed an exchange, and my last move, knight c4, didn't force anything. Notice that I have hundreds of tactics here. I can play e6, try to attack. I can play f6, try to attack. I can play knight h5, try to attack. Queen g4, try to attack. Lots of stuff. But none of it quite works. And I have to just play slowly. Bishop c2 to b1. I bring my piece back. The other possibility would be to play bishop c2 to b3. But the downside of that is then I lose my f5 pawn. And he can un unwind. Bishop c2 to b1 maintains the indirect defense of the f5 pawn. And now my opponent played knight e to d5. Now his idea makes very good sense. He wanted to unwind his pieces, but notice his knight was irrelevant on e7 was a target. Now his knight on b4 is also very relevant and does absolutely nothing. So he's just simply tried to compensate for some of the spatial disadvantage. He's tried to unwind his pieces a little bit. And now he has a threat. His threat is rook takes e5. And here I made a move which I think was a mistake. I played knight c to e4, which was a patient move, and I played bishop to b1, which was a patient move. I am of the opinion that I probably should have played one more patient move. I should have played the move bishop f2 to d4. This maintains my pawn on, f on e5, and now my, my central structure is very, very solid, and he has to make another move. I think this move would have been a little bit better than what I did. It maintains the solidity of my position, but what I played was very interesting also. I sacrificed the pawn on e5 and played queen to g4. Now I have lots of threats. One of them is simply knight h5, which is very hard for him to handle, but he has a very good way to do it. He played rook takes e5, and now the position has reached a crux. Now if you go back a moment, and you look at the position after he played knight e to d5, so far I've maintained the tension of the position. If you think about the meaning of that phrase, you'll see that there's tension all over the place. I have hundreds of ways of trying to attack him, lots of ways to bust open the position, but I don't want to do it so quickly. Because if you have a very good position and you bust things open, what you're doing is you're making things concrete. You're making them specific. And if you make things specific, then you have to be mathematically correct. And if you're mathematically incorrect, then you just lose. The greatness is the ability to improve your position to the point that the numbers work out. And often in chess, a better position really means that your position has the potential, potential for the numbers to work out. Not necessarily that the numbers work out immediately. And so if you think that when you're better, it means that you can just smash ahead and mate the guy, you're wrong. That's not what better means. What better means is that your position has the potential, if played correctly, to turn out well. So don't think that when you're better and when you're attacking, it means you can just force mate. It's not what it's about. Often the way to play best, the way to play within the position, is to maintain it. And that's why in this position I'm of the opinion that bishop to d4 was slightly better. One more move of maintaining my position. Very, very, very hard for black to make any moves now. And my next move, I'll play queen g4, and I'll start the attack. So I think I rushed by a little bit. I played queen g4. He played rook takes e5. So far, this game has been very exciting. I've played very interestingly. I've played patiently. I think a little too impatiently. I was only 16 years old. In this position, I threatened mate with knight h5. And he made a move which I didn't see until after I played knight h5. After I played knight h5, I saw his move, and I said, oh my god, look what I did. He played bishop to g6. And now we see a chess struggle. This is real chess. This is real competition. 
If I play f takes g6, he plays queen takes queen on g4, and I'm roasted. I'm in big trouble. I lost my queen. My pawn on f5 is pinned. The rest of this game is under the theme of the pinned piece. The reason I showed the last two games against Luna and Katina was to help prepare you for this game and for the ones that follow. The theme of the pinned defender and the pinned attacker is very important here. And now my pawn on f5 is the pinned attacker. He can't do anything. My opponent is threatening bishop takes h5. Notice the bishop g6 was the only way to defend mate. If he moved his pawn on g7, knight f6 would win a queen. If he played f7 to f6, exposing the queen's defense of g7, I play knight h5 takes f6, and after knight takes f6, knight takes f6, the pawn on g7 is pinned, and I win the queen. Very good fork. His only move is bishop to g6. And after that, think about the moment. We've made 25 moves. I have about 10 minutes on my clock. I missed that last move. When you miss a move, your heart starts to pound. You feel the moment. You feel a little bit nervous. You feel the heat of the moment. You think, oh no, what did I do? The moment when you make a mistake is the moment in which you have to rise as a competitor. That's what defines chess excellence, and that's what defines competitive excellence. The ability to confront the moment in which you make a mistake. In this position... I made a mistake. I missed his last move, but now I had to rise. I had to make things crazy. I didn't have much time left, and now I had to do it. I played knight takes g7. And from here, the game gets completely insane, tactical, wild, crazy. Pieces will be everywhere. But now look at what's happened. My opponent is very pleased with himself in bishop to g6. When you become pleased with, with yourself in a chess game, it's a dangerous thing. When you start to smell the roses in competition, it's a very dangerous thing. Because you lose presence in the moment. And presence in the moment is the most important thing in competition. In this position, he challenged me, and I immediately responded by challenging him back. Now what can he do? If he takes my knight on g7, which is what he did, I have things in store for him, which you'll see. But does he have anything else is the question. Does he have anything else? What is my threat? Do I have a threat? The point of the position is that I'm down an exchange, but I'm attacking. His king is open. Things are completely unclear. I'm not winning this position. Things are unclear. He played king takes g7, and I played bishop on f2 to d4. I'm down a rook now. When you're down a rook, it's dangerous. But now his rook is pinned on e5. Now you may be thinking, did I have f5 to f6 check winning a queen? It's a good idea. I'm using the line of the queen on g4 to the queen on d7. It's a very good idea, but in fact it's not correct. But if I play f6 to d f f5 to f6... Discover check. He has knight d5, takes on f6. He's responding to the check and defending his queen on d7. That's a tactic which is very tempting, very very nice looking, but it doesn't work. I play bishop d4. And here, my opponent made his decisive mistake. He played rook a to e8, a completely logical looking move. But in fact, he had a way to maybe try to save the game. What he should have played was queen d7, takes f5. Give up a rook. Give the rook back. Sometimes when you're defending and you're attacked, you have to give back the material. This is a very common idea in defense. When you're ahead in material, to give back the material. I take my his queen, queen takes f5, bishop takes f5, and I play bishop takes e5 check. He has to play king on g7 to g6. And if you look at this position, I'm down a pawn. My pieces are much better than his. I think white is probably slightly better here. But the position is completely hard to win. Very difficult position. I have moves like g2 to g4, forcing him to play bishop f5 takes g4. And then I can move my knight anywhere on the board with discovered check, but unfortunately I don't have a very good one. So I wouldn't do that. I would play more slowly. My position here is very, very good, but not necessarily winning. But this is the correct way for him to play. He had a correct way to play. When he played bishop g6, he was hit by a surge of optimism. He felt hope. He felt like he had a chance. And after I played knight takes g7, he had to confront an immediate challenge. Now we're both running short of time in the game, and I'm threatening his rook. He wasn't present at the moment. He didn't feel the immediacy of the danger. He played rook a to e8. I played queen back to g3, attacking the pinned piece. And now he's in big trouble again. If he plays f7 to f6, I play queen takes g6 check. And he's just in big trouble. I can win his rook next with bishop takes e5 if I want to. I'm up pawn... I can take on h6 check. He's, in, he's getting nailed. When he plays rook a to e8, what's happened here 
is that the position is one of pins. My bishop on d4 is pinning his rook on e5. My pawn on f5 is attacking his bishop on g6. My pawn on f5 is unfortunately pinned to my queen on g4 by his queen on d7. His bishop on g6 is also pinned, but the piece that could take the pinned piece can't take it because it's pinned itself. My move queen g4 to g3 made all the pins work out well for me. Now my pawn on f5 can take his pinned piece. His rook on e5, which is pinned, is attacked by my queen on g3 now. He played the only move to defend against all the pins. Queen on d7 takes f5. And the move that I played now made his whole position fall under attack. It's the most beautiful position which I've ever played, I think. I played knight e4 to d6. And now take a moment, take a deep breath, and look at the position. Notice that almost every single one of his pieces is attacked. His rook on e5 is attacked by my bishop on d4, my queen on g3, my rook on e1. His queen on f5, a moment ago, a move ago, was attacked by nothing. Now it's attacked by two things, my knight on d6 and my bishop on b1. His rook on e8 is also attacked by my knight on d6. Everything is attacked. Nothing, he can't do anything. I'm threatening knight takes f5 with check, and I'm threatening my rook knight takes e8 with check. So he played a logical move. He played king on g7 back to f8. And now you can notice that things can suddenly look tricky. I was attacking all those big pieces, two rooks and a queen, and now I st I'm still attacking all those pieces. But he's also attacking some of my pieces, and I only have one move to take them all. This is a critical thing. If I take his queen with my bishop on f5, he plays rook takes e1 check. I play king f2. He plays rook on e8 to e2 check. I play king f3. He plays, for instance, bishop on g6 to h5 check. I'm in trouble suddenly. I'm running. If he wants to, he can win my queen with rook e3 check. Bishop takes e3, rook takes e3. The king moves, he takes my queen. Suddenly I'm down a piece. King f2, rook takes queen. King takes queen, we trade bishops. He has two knights and I have one. I'm losing. So if you go back and you see the position, all of his pieces are attacked, but I only have one way to win the game. I take his rook on e5 with my bishop. I maintain all of the threats and I stop all of his. Now his queen is still attacked by my bishop on b1. And his queen and rook are attacked by my knight on d6. And there's no way to defend against everything. And I've taken back a rook. He has to play queen g5, but it's completely lost. He's offered a trade of queens when finally, for the first time in the game, I'm actually ahead in material. I took on e8. He took on g3. I played bishop takes g3. And he played bishop takes b1. And here is the last moment of the game. You have to make the best move. If you play rook takes b1, then after king takes e8, I'm suddenly not up too much material. It's a knight and a pawn against a rook. But my, my, my two g-pawns aren't very good. Exchange for a pawn isn't a big advantage, but I can maintain a whole rook. You have to make the best move when you're better, because those are moments in which you don't want to mess it up, and you don't want to let the guy back in the game when he's out of the game. Bishop to d6 check. King has to go to g8, because my rook guards the knight on e8. King g8, rook takes b1. I'm up a rook, and he resigned the game. He's lost.